Okay, good. It's we should be live now. And um, it is my uh, real pleasure. And it seems to be, I'm sorry, why is this? It says we're live, but then the video is not showing. This is confusing. Um, it's saying on this angle that it's live. It, it is saying, right, right, indeed. And your video, if you'd like to turn your video on, please. Let's see what's happening here. Oh, good. We, we are live. Wonderful. Right. So, uh, Dr. Gallagher, if you could kindly turn your video on. Your vi video seems to be switched off. Of course. So, uh, here we go. Wonderful. Dr. Gallagher, we, we finally, the, the entities in the machine, <laughs> they've relented. And it just, it just may be my incompetence instead of blaming demonic entities. I could you, just you, be incompetent. You, you never know. You never know. One never knows. But it's <laughs> such a, uh, such a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, for the second time onto, uh, to our podcast, uh, Professor Richard Gallagher. Professor Gallagher, if you wouldn't mind by way of uh, a few words of introduction while I pull up um, your book, your wonderful book uh, details for, for the audience to see. Uh, introducing yourself, please. Uh, sure. Well, I'm, I'm uh, Dr. Richard Gallagher. I'm a uh, American uh, board, board certified uh, psychiatrist. Uh, so I am a professor of psychiatry. And uh, I teach at, at a couple of medical schools, including New York Medical College and Columbia. And I'm also on the faculty of a, uh, the local archdiocesan St. Joseph's Seminary. So I do a lot of teaching. Uh, my educational background, I studied the classics at Princeton University. I trained in um, um, psychiatry at Yale. And like you, I also have a uh, advanced degree from Columbia. I um, uh, am, am, am a um, psychoanalyst trained at Columbia. So, uh, you know, had a lot of education, eventually uh, got involved ra rather fortuitously because I didn't really volunteer for any of this, but some Catholic priest, and I am a Catholic, um, asked me for their help in evaluating cases that they had already suspected might have a demonic component as a professor of psychiatry. I was able to do that and also became a member, a lay member of the Vatican approved International Association of Exorcists and for a time was on its uh, governing board as a scientific advisor. So, uh, you know, that's sort of the background to uh, uh, the book I wrote, because a lot of people, you know, asked me to write the book. Uh, and it was based on, on my 25 years of experience uh, investigating um, uh, diabolic attacks, especially possessions, as well as what, what you know, Hassan, the modern age calls the paranormal. Beautiful. Well, so um, before we talk um, more about your work, uh, your, your book uh, specifically, I was hoping we could reference some pop cultural stuff that uh, is cropping up these days. Um, to pull up this one article, which kind of speaks for itself. Oh, I, 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 I come from the country of pop culture, so <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with a lot of pop, pop cultural references. Well, I, for better and for worse, perhaps worse more so than better, I very often think through, not necessarily these, this particular pop cultural reference that I'm going to bring up now, but um, I very often think through popular culture and movies and things like that. And uh, I mean, one of the powerful tools, as it were, at the disposal of the waning American empire is, of course, uh, soft, soft power in the form of its cultural output. So uh, in any case, um, I mean, that, that's kind of delving uh, uh, into the realm of politics. But uh, I wanted to pull up this particular story, which has been kind of doing the rounds lately. Megan Fox and Machine Gun Kelly got engaged and drank each other's blood. Um, I, I wonder what your thoughts are, are on that. Uh, of course, Megan 
box i mean she's an actress and i mean i think it's politically correct to say actor now and Shane Gun kelly is uh, this musician neither of whom are as far as i know i, I haven't avidly followed them by any, uh, by any means but as far as i know they're not really brilliant at their craft per se so some some have uh some have said you know this is a kind of publicity stunt i'm sure that there's an element of that what immediately came to my mind rightly or wrongly is the um sort of occult nature uh, the, the sort of occult um implications for behind drinking blood of course famously christianity um reorients humanity right historically uh blood sacrifices were a, a, a very have been an ancient form of appeasing the gods and what have you and christianity seeks to change that once and for all as it were um and, and we don't necessarily have to go, go into the theology of that per se but or we could but but maybe you could start by saying a little bit about your reactions to this strange story and and telling me of course a lot a lot of people in the media reacted just by saying something along the lines of how gross and i think it's yes it's gross but i think there's something potentially deeper going on we don't know for sure of course well uh again you know uh, machine gun kelly and um and megan fox uh they are celebrities yes and um as you know, celebrity culture is built a lot around uh, getting publicity, and this this undoubtedly, like like satanic rock rock music, for instance, is often you know motivated very much by you know getting getting publicity. Uh, uh, Megan Fox is uh, is an attractive woman. She's not a great actress. Uh, Machine Gun Kelly is a young guy who's, you know, also trying to become, you know, more and more famous and sell his his work. So uh, I think you're right in suspecting, uh, I don't know the inside story, but I think you're right in suspecting that their motivation is probably largely uh, publicity. But as as you imply in your um, observation here, uh, you know it's treading on, let's say, customs that um, do have darker roots um, and and historical roots as well, um, and there is a certain amount of. I mean, I can speak to this issue without knowing their specific motivation. There, there is a um, a flavor of occultism in what they're doing, uh, whether they're aware of it or not. Uh, it was a little bit when you know. I think I think Angela and Jolie and um, Billy Bob. Thornton, if I has, have his name right. I mean, I think they did something similar with blood when they were married for a short lived time. So it, it's a little bit in the uh, in the Hollywood culture, this flirtation with rituals, uh, including, you know, espousal uh, pledges uh, that, that is a little disturbing to a lot of people. Uh, the problem is it's it's too little disturbing to some other people and then you know that this has almost become a mainstream manifestation of a kind of neo-paganism and there, there is no question that there is a recrudescence of neo-paganism in modern societies and um uh, Sometimes it's kind of, uh, you know, ludicrous and frivolous. And other times there's a darker side to it. Uh, there was a uh, American survey organization called the Pew Research People who said that recently, it's a recent poll, like one and a half million Americans had some serious 
involvement in witchcraft, which is which is staggering. Now, again, some of that is sort of uh, you know dabbling at a at a superficial level, I'm sure, but but there are there are serious you know there are serious uh, uh, neo Wiccan and witchcraft beliefs that are reflective of a kind of reemergence of pagan uh, occultism. Uh, in, in my book, I write, I sort of highlight a case of a woman who was a actual devil worshiping Satanist. And I did not want to give the impression, and in fact, in my book, I I combat the impression that, you know, there's Satanist around every corner, you know, as a as a very experienced and well trained psychiatrist, I was aware that in the latter decades of the um, past century, there, there was a tremendous hysteria, uh, again, another export from the United States uh, about um people spying satanists around every corner we, we called it in in america and, and it was prominent enough as a phenomena as a cultural phenomenon in america we called it in my field uh, the satanic panic so you know there were people claiming that you know tens of thousands of kids were being kidnapped by satanists and ritually murdered and stuff uh, somebody estimated, a more sober analyst estimated that there were far more accusations of such kidnappings by Satanists than there were actually missing children in the United States that particular time period. So there was clear exaggerations. There were innocent uh, people persecuted for, you know, supposed uh ritualism in this area uh and um yeah uh uh one has to guard against you know the excesses of each side of our polarized uh, cultural climate this uh but there are but there were also there were also are a few you know true satanist around and uh, and so you know my unique position i would say a, a unique vantage point has been to actually meet meet a few of these people so i, I darn well know that they exist and the the, the woman i wrote about was a a high priestess in a satanic cult then then when it filters down some of this occult preoccupation to the to the the culture and the pop culture there's always people who kind of you know join the bandwagon people like uh, alice cooper and and you know some of the rock bands and uh, i suspect that um, megan fox and machine gun uh, kelly have I've joined the the bandwagon. Not to say that it is interesting not enough, to say it, yeah. not to say that it's totally innocent. Right. Well, I, I was going to mention a couple of things very quickly, uh, if I may. That Alice Cooper. Um, I was literally uh, in preparation for uh, today. I was rewatching a brief interview, uh, like clip of an interview that he gave a few years ago, um, where he says in the interview, in describing. Um, both himself and Marilyn Manson, another sort of colorful shock rocker, um, that he, while he himself, Alice Cooper, self identifies as Christian, uh, which I was very surprised to hear, uh, Marilyn Manson, of course, describes himself as being, you know, the high priest of, you know, some sort of satanic uh, order. But um, so, so there is, to echo your point, there is no doubt this kind of shocking um you know element to things to to garner more you know i think you're right i think alice cooper and some of these people evolve mm. uh even megan fox has sort of uh, devolved perhaps because 
she went through a period where she realized that her popularity was based on her physicality. And she went through, you might say, a more conservative period where she decried that and said, you know, I've become much more traditional in my in my beliefs. Now she seems to, you know, the the slightly aging Megan Fox seems to have uh, latched on to, you know, this this kind of uh, exhibitionism uh, that she had uh, actually eschewed when she was younger, admittedly. The same with rock stars. I think Alex Cooper does regard himself as Christian, but it, it's hard to know how coherent people like him and, and Marilyn Manson, who was who perhaps even a better example, you know, how much they do for effect and how much they do on a serious level. But, but there are these rare people who not only exploit, you know, the public's fascination with that sort of thing, but also, uh, you know, get involved in it in a more serious uh, manner. And then, you know, it's hard to sort out sometimes the depth of their belief because, you know, whether they're doing it for, you know, publicity reasons or whether they actually seriously engage in occultism is, is sometimes a little hard to know. It's not like Satanists go around, you know, advertising themselves. Um, right. Some do, some right. do. But some do, many, but many, many, don't. many of the worst are much more clandestine. Well, I, I wanted to pick up on a, a couple of other things. Uh, also, um, going back to the um, to the discussion as to whether, to what extent, was Megan Fox and Machine Gun Kelly's sort of thing uh, just a publicity stunt? To what extent was it, um, you know, some serious occult thing? We, we will never know, really, but truly, truthfully, the answer to, to that question. However, something that you said is. To paraphrase the um, the kind of historically occult nature of such acts, almost ipso facto. I'm completely paraphrasing here, but please feel free to correct me uh, as as you see fit. Uh, just engaging in certain acts has certain, uh, from a metaphysical point of view, from a from the point of view of pure metaphysics, it has repercussions. Like one could say, right, from a traditionally Christian theological point of view, let's say, if one, or it could perhaps be argued that one need not even necessarily, as it were, believe per se in the in the significance of the sacrament, shall we say, but just just in partaking in the sacrament, there is a metaphysical thing that happens, and maybe that's the whole point of the religious life. It's over. A period of time during the course of one's lifetime that one is progressively acculturated, disciplined into the tradition, as it were. Uh, and similarly, whether one believes or recognizes necessarily the metaphysical, the deep metaphysical implication, implications of drinking people's blood, uh, 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 whether one recognizes that or not, just the act has an impact. And blood is no small thing historically in all the traditions. There's, uh, 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 um, I mean, we don't have to go on and on about this, but. Uh, no, but I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, we're both uh, students of history and, and to some extent, I think we're both interested in, in comparative religion. And you see these type of ideas, you know, sometimes even in, 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 in major religions, but you certainly see it in the, ubiquitous, you know, paganism throughout history. Um, and uh, yeah, th there has traditionally been this preoccupation with, with blood, not only in, you know, pagan cultures, some of which were pretty noble cultures, you know, I'm not certainly disparaging all uh, uh, ancient, what we call now pagan values, um, but there was this underlying, um, I would call it occultism uh, and a unconscious uh, or unaware um, 
preoccupation with propitiating forces, you know, beyond materialistic ones in the universe or metaphysically. And they, 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 they clearly, you know, they clearly felt that they were getting results. You know, I mean, people don't do these things. Uh, maybe Megan Fox does, I don't know. But, you know, people don't normally do these things on a serious level without having a, a, a meta, metaphysical scaffolding or rationale for what they're doing. And, and absolutely, you know, pagan cultures and occultists in more generally, even within, you know, more mainstream cultures, religious cultures, uh, definitely feel they get results. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't do it. In fact, the, the Satanist woman that I wrote about in my book uh, used to say, you know, people are stupid if they do these things without expecting something in return, because she had been involved in some grisly stuff herself. And I know in America, and this probably goes in all countries, you have certain occult movements like uh, Santa Rhea and uh, Santa Muerte, uh, to name two sort of Hispanic oriented occult movements that have uh, more popularity in America than is, uh, than is uh, uh, healthy to contemplate even. Uh, and they're, they're very preoccupied with things like, you know, drinking blood, shedding blood in, in ritualistic ways. So what you're talking about, uh, Hassan, is, uh, has quite serious implications, whatever the level of superficiality of, you know, celebrities who uh, jump on that bandwagon. And before we went live, we, we spoke very briefly um, about the sort of lack, in my understanding, my, as far as I can tell, the lack um, on, a, on a larger scale in, amongst the mainstream wider population of a sensitivity to symbolism, right? Um, you, you were um, referencing the beautiful um, sort of tapestry, the, the print of the tapestry behind you, the symbolism of, of that tapestry. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that tapestry, the symbolism. I, I say this because we have symbols, I mean, blood, not, not to go on and on about blood, but but the, the, uh, blood is- I'm to move my to... screen to give your audience oh, a better beautiful. look. That, that's yes, probably beautiful. about the best look that they're going to get. Oh, well, that's, uh, you know, blood is understood to be traditionally as the life force. And so consuming that life force has an impact. Uh, the symbols that we have, the religious symbols, whether in Christianity, the cross, the the, the swastika in traditional Hinduism, uh, not not the swastika that the Nazis then kind of modified for their own purpose, almost kind of almost inverted it, not quite, but they modified it certainly. All the different symbols, um, they have deep meaning, and 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 as sort of a scholar of, of of religion as such, I I personally don't think they're accidental. That whether through a long process they were kept arrived at or whether there was a divine, I would tend to say there was a divine kind of inspirational aspect to that. Similarly, there are symbols which have a sort of an inverse impact upon our psyches metaphysically and so forth. But could you say a little bit about the importance of symbolism? Can you say a little bit about the importance of the symbolism, the symbolism of this tapestry, what it means? And then we could maybe- Well, yeah. the, the tapestry, uh which is housed at the moment in the cloisters, uh, not far from Columbia, where both you and I did some studies, uh, is a, they're called the unicorn tapestries. That's the, the last of the one, the unicorn tapestry It's probably the most famous. And it has the unicorn who was a symbol for Christ. And it, it shows his, um, the, a wound speaking about the symbolism of blood in his, uh, the side of the unicorn. Um, he's also chained and he's revivified. 
yeah, there you go. Very good picture. And it's the medieval world uh, tended to uh, use multiple uh, symbols in some of their more artistic creations. It is a it is a symbol of Christ. In fact, at the bottom, I'm not sure that you can see it well. There's uh, the Greek letters Alpha and Omega, which again in in Revelations is a is a symbol of uh, Christ. And uh, clearly, this is the symbol of the resurrected Christ, who nevertheless suffered for our sins. And uh, you know, there's nothing merely symbolic about that. Of course, we we Christians believe he did suffer for our sins, uh, and and you know, we see it as. The price he paid, you might say, in if nothing else, in 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 also symbolizing his love for us. So, in that sense, the the blood imagery is um, in, in a way that sometimes become incomprehensible to the modern age. Is 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 a symbol of his sacrificial love for us, uh, but you know, at the same time, you know, there have been many uh, pagan and occult preoccupations with blood in a, you know, in a, in a kind of negative way. Um, I always say to people, you know, the new age movement, so to speak, which is a modern term for a lot of paranormal and occult experiences that people have, it's a complete misnomer because it's not it's not new all these beliefs you know in um, uh, vision certain visionary uh, experiences in um, uh, energy healings and um, other types of paranormal journeys like astral projection uh, you know, these are all ideas that are found all throughout history. There's nothing new about them. Fortune telling, for instance. And the popularity of these things, these these matters, is is ancient. I mean, it was in the in the Tanakh or the Old Testament, you know, it, it was condemned right from the beginning in, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Uh, so there's nothing new about this stuff. And um, again, when we talk about modern occultism, as well as, you know, some modern explicit Satanism, we're, we're talking about phenomena that has been found throughout all of history. Thank you for that. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm paying attention. This is one of my, and I'm kind of sharing some stuff at the same time. And it's just uh, the the blessing of having ADD. <laughs> like I can somehow somehow feel better. And maybe I mean you know better than me. I'm sure that maybe ADD as a kind of I don't know if condition is quite quite the right word, but as a as a human phenomenon is part of. Um, it's kind of it speaks to the modern condition, right? Where where our attention is constantly being disperse in a multiplicity of directions so maybe having ADD is you know whether consciously or un unconsciously mostly it's a response to that it's a way to kind of well survive. I certainly you know as a psychiatrist and you know in many ways a mainstream psychiatrist I, yes. I certainly believe that it's a uh, legitimate condition what it is is primarily uh, the end of the bell curve in other words you know people's attention, proclivities, temperament, whatever you want to call it. And, and you know, there is a, a biological tendency in that direction, you know, possibly exacerbated by cultural and environmental factors, but uh, it's, it's in, ingrained enough that, for instance, it's very genetic. Mm -hmm. and, and there are, you know, medications that some people want to use and other people don't want to use that have some some positive effect but it's essentially the end of the bell curve the people who have more of that tendency than 
others. Uh, and I don't necessarily see it as super pathological. It's just, it's, it's a difference on the spectrum. I mean, I teach, I teach, I teach a lot of things. Uh, I do teach demonology. Uh, a dubious, right. well, well, speaking a dubious, of demonology. A dubious distinction in people's, some people's view, but I also teach, you know, psychopharmacology and so. Well, no, you, you are, I mean, you're really the kind of person we need today in, in, in that you really have this wide, you know, sort of broad uh, knowledge base, which we, we need to, I believe that we need perhaps now more than ever, the, the sort of historic archetypal Renaissance man, and I mean, typically Renaissance man, but we need Renaissance men and women Speaking of demonology and speaking of symbols, um, could you say a little bit about this symbol? I, I, I mean, I, I hesitate to have it up too long. I just happen to be very, very sensitive as, as just my, my wiring is such that, uh, again, I don't think symbols are neutral. Symbols are never neutral. We are symbolic creatures. We're, as far as we know, we're unique amongst all sort of living beings in that we create symbols which have meanings that transcend the very sort of materiality of, of, of I mean they, they transcend them way beyond and and some something apparently simple as an inverted pentagram actually has very deep I would say right from a traditional uh, theological metaphysical point of view it has deep implications deep reverberation in fact, uh, but yeah. Well, look, you're an academic, so you know you're particularly sensitive, you know, in in a in a sensible way about the power uh, uh, of symbols. Uh, and the pentagram is is I think we talked about before we got on air about uh, you know inverted uh, inverted crucifix and stuff like that. You know, these are powerful symbols of, you know, the darker side of, uh, of uh, metaphysical thought. And uh, again, these kind of paraphernalia, which, you know, probably when I was a kid in, in, in American culture would have been extremely, you know, frowned upon uh, as well as, as mocked. Uh, now, now, you know, to some extent, uh, you know, they, they, they have a little bit of a place in the mainstream. Uh, again, wouldn't, one shouldn't uh, exaggerate uh, the prevalence of this stuff and, and, and of Satanism in general, but it, uh, it, it exists. It just... and what is Satanism? Could you say a little bit? I mean, I, I was having a discussion with a friend yesterday, uh, just via chat, um, that she was uh, arguing, and I think rightly so, she, she showed her proof and, you know, uh, like her sources that Satanists aren't necessarily uh, Satan worshippers, and there, there are a lot of atheistic Satanists, and I think the, the, the church, the Satanic church, or the Satanic temple, I forget which one, they at least publicly, they say they're atheistic and they have certain values that that ring true from a humanistic point of view. But could you could you say a little bit about Satanism? What is it, broadly speaking, historically? Well, you know, the, the the flip answer is Satanism is a word that people use differently, ah, yes, and yes. there is certainly a wide spectrum yes. of uh, people who you know call themselves Satanists or characterize as Satanists who you know, regard it as, as harmless. Uh, there are theistic <laughs> Satanists, and strange to say, there are this category of people who even call themselves atheist Satanists. Right, very interesting, yes, yes. I think they're even, you know, to show the incoherence of the human mind, I think they're, yes. even, they're, they're even Satanists who say, well, I don't really believe in Satan, but I, I'm a Satanist. So, you know, there's, there's a certain... It There's reminded a me incoherence to. Yeah, well, I, to, I, I thought, sorry to interrupt, but it, um, it occurred to me. Uh, I, I thought I can help but think of atheist Christians, like people self identify as, as being atheist Christians. So, right. Yeah. Right. 
and and so there's this wide spectrum and then there are people who might be described as as dabblers or you know innocent uh, almost innocent teenagers who you know use it for shock value and effect as a kind of adolescent rebellion but again i'm i'm in the unusual position of having met and talk to, uh, uh, strangely, some of them, you know, want to talk to me uh, about their beliefs. And, uh, you know, I'm aware too that there, there are serious uh, Satanists. Uh, I would describe the committed Satanists who are often more clandestine in their habits, but they, they unequivocally seriously worship Satan. And as we were talking about before, it can sound like, well, aren't we dealing with either stupid or superstitious people? You know, trust me, some of these people are quite intelligent and they absolutely believe they are, you know, getting favors in return, just as, you know, the pagans throughout history who sacrificed to gods and goddesses, uh, they thought they were getting something in return. Um, the, the ancient mythology around gods and goddesses uh, often portrayed them as mixed figures who certainly had a malign side to them as well. And, you know, often were portrayed mythologically as petty and, and all these kinds of envious, these kind of things. So they unwittingly, in my opinion, and I think the, the ancient Hebrews, you know, picked this up more explicitly than any other ancient subculture. Uh, they eventually, as did the Christians and, and much of the Islamic world, uh, began to interpret the the pagan deities as veiled, you know, figures of, uh, of, of of demonic nature. And and in your own um, sort of experience um, experiences, you've been uh, you've been a practicing psychiatrist for more than two decades. To more, I mean nearly three decades even more so and uh, and and you've been an advisor to the catholic church um it, could you say a little bit about that you it's sort of in, in the role that oh, you know i tell people i've told you individually yes. hassan that everything i've done in this field i was asked to do it's not like i went out and volunteered to get involved in this i mean i developed an academic interest in it to be sure and have written about it but basically all my, my experience, uh, I know my former chairman uh, of psychiatry had said once, I'm probably the physician who has seen more of these cases than anyone in history. And in part that's because people, you know, you know, I've traveled and done things on Zoom and stuff and, and you know, people have sought me out. And uh, eventually, you know, people asked me to write, write the book, which was the compendium of my uh, experiences. But all these things we're talking about, you know, Satanism, neo-pagans, et cetera, uh, often, you know, get involved and are immersed or become attacked uh, in ways that the, uh, secular culture calls the calls the paranormal uh and so i will see these people who claim to be attacked by evil spirits or sometimes just have visionary experiences of evil spirits and these evil spirits getting back to what we were just talking about will sometimes identify themselves even in contemporary times as gods and goddesses you know i had a i had a guy who came to my office who was clearly possessed and you know possessed people generally have their very coherent rational side 
Obviously, I'm expected to make sure that they're not just psychotic and suffering from delusions or hallucinations. And this gentleman, you know, there's no question he was unequivocally possessed. And he would say, um, and I heard some of the some of the evil spirit voices come out of him. Uh, and he said to me, uh, by the way, Zeus is also in touch with me. And oh, wow. He, he, sa he said, do you want to talk to him? Because he felt he could allow oh. Zeus by his lights to manifest itself. Oh, wow. And I said, no, I don't particularly want to talk to him because... Yeah. By that point, I had realized that he was being besieged by evil spirits who were just lying. And mm -hmm. that's what evil spirits do. They often pretend they're, you know, famous figures, warriors, dead souls, and gods and goddesses. Just as a very prominent example from history would be the Delphic Oracle. The Delphic Oracle would go into a trance and the voice of Apollo would emerge from her, would have access to this amazing knowledge. And it's because she voluntarily, usually a virgin, you know, girl in the area, peasant girl, would allow herself to become temporarily in a voluntary basis possessed. Now, like everything else in life, and you're aware of this too, as a student of, uh, you know, these phenomena, you know, there are a lot of theories about it, you know, well, maybe they were drugged, maybe they were, you know, experiencing vapors at Delphi, but, you know, to me, as someone with so much experience in this area, uh, I could say unequivocally that these oracles, there was another one at, at Dodona in, in modern Turkey, uh, who was another oracle who claimed Zeus was speaking to her. And it was a very similar thing. And people came from all over the world. And, and, and people even, you know, generals and high officials of, you know, Imperial Rome would come to get knowledge from this woman, these women. And, you know, there, there, we, there you go. There's... Uh, uh, the Delphi uh, Shrine, which uh, I've also visited, and uh, not in not in great shape, but uh, still striking. And um, uh, you know, I always tell people: people don't travel in the old days from Rome to you know mainland Greece at Delphi unless they think they're getting some valid knowledge, and that valid knowledge, which we call in Latin, Latra, L-A-E-T-R-A, is precisely what people are seeking for when they go to fortune tellers, some of whom are frauds, but some of them have this amazing capacity to reveal you know, hidden things, which is the translation of Latra. And in the same way, one of the criteria that we use for valid possessions is Latra. You know, they have to have, you know, hidden knowledge, be speaking in foreign languages that the person has no idea themselves, exhibit, you know, abnormal strength or, or bodily manifestations that are super, that are, you know, preternatural. Uh, these are precisely the kind of things that are not caused by naturalistic uh, reasons and they're, they're why we can successfully diagnose people in the first place as, a, as suffering from something like possession. Our, our contemporary fascination with the occult in, in sort of mainstream discourses and, and sort of our cultural productions and consumption, uh, what does, where do you think things are going? I mean, one could say, look, uh, our fascination with the, you know, these sort of non-physical dimensions, that's just part and parcel of being human, the sort of excessive, uh, you know, overemphasis on a scientific way of looking at things, things are just sort of manifestations of uh, matter and energy, that, that, that argument, that sort of worldview is insufficient, we are kind of 
uh, mythological by, by nature and temperament. That's why we're always seeking higher, deeper meanings that may or may not even be there. Uh, that could be one argument. At the same time, it seems to me, uh, rightly or wrongly, that some of these themes keep cropping up. Certain themes, these, it, 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 it's not completely random. There, there's certain interests and certain types of magic, certain types of rites, certain types of entities, certain types of um, uh, sort of, uh, what was I going to say? Right, you know, the inversion of the traditionally accepted modes of doing things, right? The, what's very often in sort of religious discourse has historically been described as the left-hand path, right? So it, it seems to me there's, some of these things keep cropping up and I'm not convinced that it's all accidental, it's just coincidence. Well, uh, I mean, to get lot, conspiratorial. Lot could, you know, Hassan, a lot could be, be said about this whole subject. Uh, first of all, it, it, it is important to recognize that, I mean, you're absolutely right, that materialism, you know, and scientism, you know, don't really satisfy very many people. So, uh, I can speak in America, you know, there are very few pure materialists. And, and there are these skeptic societies which, you know, try to debunk, you know, quote the paranormal or parapsychology. And, you know, they're, they're, they're a small minority because most people know that there, is a, there, are, there are weird things and paranormal things that happen. Uh, you know, we, we uh, Catholics, to distinguish them between, you know, genuine supernatural things like miracles, uh, which are found in the Old and New Testament, uh, versus, and in, and in modern times too, although they require discernment. Uh, and then we, we, we call most of the other parapsychology, parapsychological phenomena, by that I mean, clearly non-materialist phenomena of an overt nature, we, we, we call that the preter, preternatural or beyond natural as distinct from the supernatural. And the preternatural is kind of the realm of the, the demonic. And there have always been people in history who have been fascinated by that, uh, some, some unhealthily preoccupied with it. What is peculiar about the modern age is that as you know, mainstream religion has declined. You know, I'm sure. I'm sure in certain areas of the world, you know, traditional Islam has declined. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, more more uh, orthodox, you know, Christian religions and 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 and, and Jewish beliefs have declined something always comes in to fill the gap. So people are looking for these phenomena and unfortunately, sometimes unwittingly, they, they, they get immersed in darker phenomena without realizing that it's dark. And, 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 and perhaps, perhaps through, uh, as a result of curiosity or, or whatever the case may be, uh, people who maybe aren't prepared, who don't have the discernment, the, the, the requisite spiritual, intellectual tools to, to sift through what's right and what's wrong, they, they also can be easily duped by a lot of these things. Absolutely. And, and some of them are, are, you know, duped for their whole life and kind of, you know, have a kind of false belief system. Uh, Others, others get in over their head and curiosity can kill the cat. And right. They're they, the cat that has nine lives, right? Curiosity kills it. <laughs> right. But the it, cat it, that it, apparently cannot, it's hard it's, to kill. It, it's only nine. And, you know, eventually. But those type of individuals, if they don't have any, you know, sounder spiritual 
understanding, in a way they're in worse shape because they don't know what the heck is going on. Many of them eventually begin to believe, hey, this is some kind of non-material spiritual attack on me. It's gotta be by, you know, malign spiritual entities. And they come to believe that, you know, believe in evil spirits, which most people throughout history have always believed, by the way, this is, you know, people sometimes say to me as a psychiatrist, well, how does it feel to be out of the mainstream? I said, well, psychiatrists, you know, often see psychotic phenomena. So a lot of psychiatrists and, 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 and very scientifically minded people. And, and, you know, I regard myself as, as very respectful of scientific methodology, but it's a methodology and, you know, you can be a scientist and, and be a believer of all sorts. And I say to people, I'm not out of the mainstream. <laughs> you are, because, you know, all the major religions believe in evil spirits to this day certainly in principle. And, you know, I mean, one third of the world is Christian. I mean, you know, you read the Christian literature, it's filled with beliefs about evil spirits. You read the Islamic literature, which is a third of the human race, you know, they, they, they believe very strongly in Satan and evil spirits. So I am hardly, I'm hardly uh, out of the, out of the mainstream. I mean, that quote you just put on the screen was originally sort of from Baudelaire. Right, right, yes. And I like the way that C.S. Lewis, um, a, a great student of the demonic, by the way, mm. you know, he, he used to say, you have to avoid both extremes. You have to avoid the idea that demons don't exist, which, you know, their strategy is very, there you go. Their strategy is very um, varied. So for some people, you know, it appears their strategy is to convince them that they don't exist. And they often, you know, hide themselves even in possessions. On the other hand, C.S. Lewis also said the, the other danger is to become, you know, preoccupied with them and worried about them and, and thinking like they control everything, which is yes. not the case. Yes. And of course, I mean, he, he would certainly agree that the worst thing is to actually, you know, somehow become, you know, at their mercy by your own instigation, you know. But anyway, these are the type of people who can sometimes get in trouble and they often find their way to, to my door or the door of clergy or something. I mean, I'm hardly the only psychiatrist in the world who believes in this stuff. So, you know, they often seek out, you know, the few psychiatrists who understand this stuff, although usually it's more practical for them to go to a clergy person locally. Could you say a little bit about that, please? Um, I, uh, I was actually watching a, a YouTube video for we started out a little while before we started our conversation today, and uh, it was an in, uh, interview done with <clears throat> a Catholic priest in the States. I forget his name, unfortunately, but he apparently, um, you may know him. Um, he's one, one of the most sought out Catholic priests who does exorcisms. He receives something like, if I'm not misremembering, 1,500 requests a year. And, and, and very you think often- He's an American? He's American, yes, yes, yes. If he's an American, I know him. <laughs> you, you probably, might. I can uh, probably pull up the, the YouTube video, but um, what, something that struck me and doesn't surprise me actually, and because well, I, I, I think I was relearning this this bit of information, important piece of information that people who seek out the help of exorcists aren't necessarily even religious or Catholic or which is very interesting. And, and, and I, I was hoping you can comment a little bit on that, but also, and relatedly, how it seems to me, and you've already spoken uh, to this a little bit, um, that it seems to be one of the um, ways in which different traditions can have serious, as it were, interfaith dialogue, right? That we believe in unseen, unseen realms, we believe in forces of light 
as well as forces of darkness. Uh, and let's come together in discussion, in serious discussion about this, exchanging, learning from one another, breaking bread, and, and, and seeing a deeper commonality in, in that regard. Well, you know, that's always hampered a little bit by what the medieval world used to call odium theologicum. You know, <laughs> there's often, uh, you know, competition and, and, and drawing of legitimate, you know, distinctions, but you're absolutely right. There is a great, uh, there's a great path for interfaith collaboration and, and mutual dialogue in these areas. And, and that does happen to an extent. There you go. That does happen to an extent. Um, you know, for instance, there there are, you know, there are uh, Islamic imams who, who who deal with this. Uh, there are, you know, many Protestant uh, delivery ministries. Uh, the the difficulty is sometimes, you know, it gets. In, in, in certain circles, I'm not overgeneralizing, you know, it gets mixed up with mercenary uh, motives and, um, you know, wanting publicity and, and you know, sometimes a, a, a too uh, simplistic uh, or misguided uh, understanding of this whole subject, sometimes exaggerated, you know. So you get people who blame all medical illnesses on the devil, that sort of thing. Uh, so one has to be careful, you know, who one goes to. But, you know, thankfully in, in, the, in the Catholic tradition, which, which has had excesses too, historically. Uh, but, you know, you're usually dealing with, you know, somebody who's fairly well educated. Uh, they've gone through rigorous seminary training and then they are specifically chosen if they're an officially appointed exorcist. Uh, they've gone through specialized training to make sure that they're. The, the, yeah. the, this is the priest. Uh, I, 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 uh, I think, I don't, yeah, I, I think, is that, uh, that's either Father Lampert or Father Rossetti. <laughs> Uh, Maybe Rossetti. I think it's Rossetti. Yes. Yeah, Rossetti, and Rossetti is a psychologist. Oh wow! Yes, yes. So he's, you know, he's he's based in Washington D.C. I hope by mentioning that he doesn't get another three thousand. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's a very sensible guy. Uh, I, I don't agree with him a thousand percent on everything he says, but he's basically very good at discernment, very holy. A uh, very intelligent guy uh, well, gets something very that good, gets very good results. He wrote a book recently called, I think, "The Diary of an Exorcist." Oh uh, well, yeah. Again, I don't. You know, look, there are nuances of this field. I don't agree with him every, every single thing he says, but he, he's a very educated, thoughtful, effective exorcist who's who, as you say, is incredibly busy. Well, and. Um... Uh, well, if we are to see uh, exorcists and uh, exorcism as such as as a branch of human knowledge, uh, in, in this case specifically of Catholic uh, knowledge production, but also practice, then it stands to reason just as in other branches of knowledge, there are sort of healthy disagreements about different positions but that's in the very nature of things right something that also struck me by yeah I, and I, I don't want to overemphasize any kind of disagreements no. because yes, you know i'm sure that uh you know 98 percent of what father rossetti is is believing and teaching you know i i i i'm sure that i would there that's his book yeah uh, it's a very interesting read. It's, uh, it'd be shocking to, to certain people. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in most ways, it's a, it's a very sensible book. Uh, and he is, you know, certainly interpreting his work as I do yes. from a very, you know, uh, standard Orthodox Catholic, uh, Orthodox Christian perspective. Right. And, and speaking of that, Orthodox Christian perspective, something that I was struck by in, in, 
in the interview and, and also when we spoke originally uh, nearly a year ago now in February of last year, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, something that exorcists and, and people in this line of work, as, 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 such as yourself as an advisor to exorcists, you, your training and your practice impels you to to be the ultimate skeptics right that that you you the, the first port of call the first assumption isn't that someone is is possessed one has to sift through the different symptoms could, could you say a little bit about that please no no that's exactly right uh, a slightly rever revised version of the very venerable manual still used by the Catholic Church in, in a set of broader prayers called the Roman Ritual, has always advised a certain sobriety and uh, let's say uh, lack of hysteria in, in, in people chosen for this position. I mean, you need to be able to be open to ruling out medical and psychiatric conditions that have historically always been confused for demonic attacks. I um, mean, that's in many ways why I wrote my own book to, to highlight for people the many mistakes, you know, overly credulous people can make. But the Roman ritual itself talks about certain qualities uh, of an exorcist who was supposed to, you know, use psychological sciences as needed, and who also is supposed to be a person who doesn't jump to conclusions, uh, is well trained, is experienced, uh, and is not, you know, prone to go off on, you know, histrionic uh, exaggeration. Uh, it's a careful, it's a careful process, and it should be. And I, I'm not saying only the Catholics are careful about it, but it may be that the Catholic Church, which you know tends to codify a lot of things and you know use use the, its own canon law system, uh, is particularly um, careful. And, and people, uh, exorcists, that is priests. Who carry out these exorcisms? What rate of success do they have? Can one assign uh, numbers or? Well, oh, everything everything differs because you got to remember, you know what what the Catholic priest would say, and I'm sure you know most Protestant exorcists and would also say is it's not us doing the work; it's our Lord. You know, I mean, the demons aren't going to, you know, just obey the priest, you know, they're forced by our Lord eventually to submit. And, and they have good, you know, they have good results. Now, an indispensable part of getting good results, because I think I also emphasize when we talked before, Hassan, uh, these prayers are not magic. You know, priests are not witch doctors. They're not just doing, you know, the prayers are important, don't get me wrong, but it's because they're invoking our Lord. And it's also because it's part of a larger spiritual effort for the person themselves to fight the demonic attack. So there, there are, you know, spiritual prayers and, and encouragement of the victim that is very, very important. Once again, I'm not saying that the exorcism prayers are unimportant. They're also an important part of the process, but it's not just the prayers. For instance, the, the example of the Satanist woman I called Julia in my book is a perfect example of what I'm saying. Um, she had she had several exorcisms uh, during one of which, by the way, although I was not attending, you know, eight or nine people told me she levitated and spoke all kinds of foreign languages. Uh, that's not psychiatric. That's not, that's not a psychiatric problem. 
But the reason that she was not and appa apparently levitation is not an uncommon thing in, in, in these. Well, it's you know. uncommon, but oh, it's okay. not. It's not. It's not unheard of. It's by no means unheard of. I have probably spoken to about thirty-seven people in my life who have either undergone levitation or you know witnessed it in a, in a close person who was demonically attacked, and and you know uh, occultist and spiritualist also have claimed levitation because it has the same source you know but uh you know the 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 point is this satanist woman wasn't delivered yeah there, there we go uh you know the, the that's from the exorcist that, that's from the famous movie of course and it was based it was based on a real case there's yes. controversy about the case it was a boy from maryland you know you're always going to get skeptics and you're always going to get arguments i you know i i didn't i didn't consult on that case so i can't give an a definitive opinion but there were some very strange things happening in that kid's life and uh julia the satanist i read i read about in my in my book demonic foes um was never delivered because she refused to leave the cult you know you can't have it both ways you can't have your cake and eat it too you know, you can't do whatever the heck you want in life, including worship Satan, but then expect you're going to be delivered from Satan's power of the possession. Well, well to um, to go back to one of the early things that you mentioned, which relates to this, of course, is how very often people will turn to these occult practices um, and, and, and sort of cults in order to gain powers in order yes, to gain powers absolutely. And there's very interesting um uh, which she did and she, which she did all, and she, she didn't want all, to get she had all kinds of psychic abilities mm. and she she also you know i mentioned she didn't really want to leave the cult i think she was also afraid of the cult she was so she was in a very precarious conflicted situation but she also didn't want to she didn't want to lose her psychic powers I, I was uh, watching, re-watching recently, uh, uh, maybe for the second watching or third time. Watching what? I was re-watching recently, maybe for the second or third or fourth time. It was a short video, which I highly recommend. An interview with uh, the lead singer, lead guitarist of Megadeth, Dave Mustaine. Very mm. big name, very big band. Um, and who in recent years has, um, he self-identifies as, as Christian and, and you know, uh, as far as one can tell, you know, in his own way, devout. But he openly admits in this interview that he used to be Satanist and he did all sorts of hexes as a teenager and over many, many years. And he said, very matter of fact, very sane human being, very successful musician, and he's very sober uh, 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 in this uh, interview very clearly. Uh, he says, these entities are real. Uh, one can and does gain better powers through these through these practices. I mean, I'm paraphrasing some of the words uh, that um, I've I've experienced them. I've experienced them, and uh, I'm glad I no longer participate in those things. But these things are real. And he also mentions very interestingly. Uh, and I wonder what your take is on this. It's quite striking. All of it is very striking. But this particular thing comes to my. Uh, 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 more powerfully than the other stuff maybe that he said the way that the devil is very often depicted as you know this sort of ugly form with these horns and he said the devil is not that it's he's beautiful he comes he can take the form of human beings and is very well, what's well your he problem? can take i mean in in a, in a sense you might say his spiritual state is quite ugly he can manifest themselves in all sorts of ways. And there's no question that, you know, he's brilliant and evil spirits are, are, I would say as a general rule, as pure spirits, they are much more intelligent than human beings. So they, they fool uh, a lot of, a lot of, they fool a lot of people. Yeah. And, and those who have a serious involvement, you know, can sometimes be struck by you know, seduced by, you know, the things they gain. Uh, but it's, you know, it's obviously a fool's, a fool's bargain.
And then there are other people, you know, who are just duped and they feel they are gifted, but they don't really know where that gift is coming from. They're naive. Uh, Julia, the Satanist, I, I had many conversations with, and she was kind of forced to talk to me. I mean, I, these are not patients of mine. You know, I, she was forced to talk to me because the priest didn't trust her. And they said, we want you to talk to, you know, this doctor. Um, but she, uh, you know, she was polite to me and, you know, she wanted an exorcism, which was contradictory to, you know, her really working at it because she, she refused to work at it. But uh, she used to say, these people who think they're gifted, and I, I'm not saying there aren't spiritually gifted people, there are, but I think they're outweighed by people who begin to think they're gifted when, uh, because they have some kind of paranormal abilities. Uh, because they're in worse shape, because they don't really know where they're getting these powers. And uh, Julia used to say about them, they're all, they're all fooled. She says, I'm not fooled. I, I know exactly where I'm getting my powers. They're from Satan. And, and, because, and, because I've done so many things that Satan likes. Wow. wow. And the, so someone like Dave Mustaine, um, it seems, I mean, I don't know him, obviously, but uh, based on this interview and based on his account, it seems he was able to extricate himself from. Yeah, well, look, by the grace of God, I mean, you know, people come to an awareness and, uh, you know, it's great that he uh, eventually realized. He but was, but it's not a given. It's not it's not well. easy. Right. I mean, the, the Faustian ba bargain, I mean, to what extent the famous story uh, of Dr. Faustus, he makes this bargain with, with the devil uh, in order to have earthly success. He basically uh, gives the devil his soul. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, it's a poor summary, but essentially that's the story. Um, how reversible or irreversible is the Faustian bargain? Well, it's, I mean, people have freedom. So it, theoretically, you know, it's always reversible, you know, presumably until death, you know, I mean, that's the whole story of the prodigal son and, you know, people, you know, our Lord and, and, and God, the father, uh, you know, want people to convert and, you know, in some ways are very, very patient with, you know, even recalcitrant human beings. So potentially anybody can change, but you have to, you have to make an internal decision that that's what you're going to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, is, it is hard for certain people. I mean, you know, sinful behavior in general and, you know, evil and sinful behavior becomes almost addictive for a lot of people. And it also clouds their, their thinking so that very evil people you know, you could mention many examples throughout history. Uh, they may, you know, while they're alive, they may get sort of a lot of what they want in life, but there's something, you know, missing. There's something screwed up about their thinking. And, you know, one of the biggest prices of that type of a, a lifestyle is often you become, you know, jaded and, you know, unaware of, of the true nature of, of reality. You know? And uh, we will we'll, uh, slowly uh, you know, wrap up. I don't want to be respectful of your time. I'm very, very appreciative uh, of your time as always. Um, this is our second time meeting. I'm very, very grateful. Uh, what would your advice be to people who perhaps um, have had some sort of encounters with the supernatural which uh, cannot be explained in sort of traditional religious terms uh, they perhaps have maybe unwittingly through whatever whatever means uh, whatever the means may have been they've opened up a certain aspect of maybe their psyche or, or they, they've tapped into things which perhaps they shouldn't have they're now um, perhaps tormented a little bit by, uh, 
by some entities. I, I, I mean, without going into too much detail, but I, I, I know, you know, uh, I know of, you know, spoken to a couple of people who've had these experiences and uh, these things seem to not just go away by themselves. Uh, even no, if, no, even they, if the same they, people they have had very serious religious, away. yeah. They, they don't go away by themselves generally, and generally people need some help. Uh, I, don't, I don't say, you know, if the attack is minor, that, you know, some kind of genuine conversion experience, you know, could, could relieve the person of that problem. But, uh, you know, it, it requires a kind of change of life and often change of lifestyle. I mean, you know, everybody's different. So, you know, it's hard to overgeneralize exactly what somebody should do. But, you know, what I advise people is, look, this is, a, this is a, some kind of attack on you. It's serious. You got into it. I'm not blaming you. We don't judge people. Uh, but you have to turn now to God as you see them, as you see him, and try to, you know, ask for guidance. Uh, if you're open to it, you know, go to uh, a sensible, intelligent clergy person in your area, ask for help, ask for instruction. Uh, but, you know, sort of get down on your knees and start to do the spiritual work that you may well on some level have always sort of, you know, known you need to do, but you've been, you know, waylaid a little bit in different ways to, you know, suppress, you know, that part of yourself. I mean, I, you know, St. Paul in the epistles used to, you know, say, you know, we all have some awareness of, you know, true spiritual realities, whether, whether one agrees with that or not. It is certainly true that some people get involved in these things uh, without being judgmental, I would say, should, should have known better, you know, uh, and now they have to kind of admit their mistake, take responsibility for it, and, you know, use their, their God-given intelligence to figure out a ways to, to progress in their life, you know, spiritually. And, and do you think, and not to make too big a deal of this, but uh, I can't help but think a little bit in this regard, in this way, which is to say that, do you think this almost, this kind of attitude, which we, we touched upon already a little bit today, that these things are you know, just a figment of, of the collective imagination, people make stuff like this up, and it's all, it's all harmless, it's all just fun and games, and the plethora of shows that kind of, to my mind, not to get conspiratorial, but uh, it strikes, it seems to me that there's almost a normalization of these practices, these arts, these, for want of a better way of putting it, these dark arts, one may say. Do you think some, there's a, that's playing something of a role? Where there's people just, uh, as far as people's dabbling into the, in these, in these areas. Yeah. Like, well, look, I think there is, you know, in the developed world, uh, a, a certain cultural decline. Uh, again, we're both students of history. We know that, you know, there's, to me, there's never been this golden age, you know, where, you know, everybody was on the straight and narrow. Having said that, uh, yeah, as mainstream religion, certainly in the West, uh, has declined, you know, something always fills the gap and people have turned to, to things that, uh, you know, are, are spiritually unhealthy. Some perhaps, you know, for shallow motives, you know, not to judge, not to judge Megan Fox and uh, Machine Gun Kelly. I don't know what their motivation is, but uh, other people in, in more serious ways and, uh, yeah, they should, on the other hand, realize that, you know, while there's life, there's hope, there's no, there's no point at which, you know, literally God, you know, is pursuing them to, to change these, you know, bad habits, whether that's, you know, sort of 
the slightly almost innocent dabblers versus the, you know, serious occultists. I was muted there. Well, well, that's that's incredible. I, I really appreciate it. Um, any sort of uh, final remarks? I mean, it's this is a very very rich topic. Something that I'm completely a novice when it comes to thinking about thinking through. Well, you know, the other thing, and and it's a very C.S. Lewis type of statement. Uh, you know, you need people need to strike a sensible balance here. Uh, you know, those of us who are Christian believe the ultimate victory is our Lord. That tragic as many things are, and one can think about, you know, abuse, the Holocaust, wars in history, etc. You know, famines, uh, injustice. Uh, Yet, you know, God doesn't want these things, but the traditional teaching is that he is so values human freedom that he allows us even to mess up our own lives, let alone the world, but that the ultimate victory is his. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying everybody is, you know, going to be saved or something i'm not saying that uh and, and there are there are you know serious thinkers who believe that but uh i i do think that flies in the face of traditional religious thinking but on an individual level you know we we can be assured that nothing happens without some reason and that if we you know sincerely seek goodness and love and to try to discern and do the will of God, you know, we really have nothing to worry about. Beautiful. And, and uh, it, it bears reminding ourselves that um, Christ in, in, of course, in the Christian tradition, but also in the Islamic tradition was and is the great healer. And one of Christ's major missions from a Christian point of view, and if I'm not mistaken, from an Islam point of view, was to exorcise people, is was to heal people from demonic possession. That was that was not an insignificant part of his ministry, was it not? Is that not the case? Well, it was it was an integral part of his ministry, and you know, uh, as was his healings, healing the sick. Uh, and you know. Once again, you know, it's a complicated world. People misinterpret these things. They say, well, Jesus was just dealing with mental illness or, you know, these were psychosomatic cures. Uh, uh, I mean, I think those to a true, to a person who truly understands the soundness of that literature as well as um, human motivation, I mean, well, and, and you're yeah. someone who's uniquely it's placed. Impo it's, it's, it's impossible to believe that those were the explanations. There and is no question that, and he made a distinction, by the way. There was no question that he healed people miraculously. And, and miracles still occur. And that he drove out demons from people. And, you know, again, contrary to what a lot of people would like to believe, you know, the church is still driving out demons. So in a way, they each reinforce each other. You know, Christ left the authority to the church to drive out demons. But the fact that we're still doing this offers credibility to the historical accuracy of those accounts. And he said at some point, you know, uh, he was talking about Herod, who, who wanted a sign and wanted to entrap him. He said, you, you tell that fox, you know, people are being healed, demons are being driven out. And he identified himself as the son of man from the book of Daniel. He said, know that if that happens, you know, the kingdom of the son of man has arrived. And that's, of course, what we believe. It's still arriving. <laughs> in its fullness, 
uh, in the in the course of uh, you know history and beyond, we'll we'll understand exactly what he meant by that. But uh, I do believe that the driving out of demons is a absolute you know historical symbol as well as reality of the coming of the the kingdom of God that was so well prophesized in the Tanakh and which is very, very slowly, uh, but unequivocally happening in history. Beautiful. So, so very beautiful. A very powerful note to, uh, to end on for today. Uh, deeply moving. I mean, we started off by talking about Megan Fox and Machine Gun Kelly, but this is a very beautiful note to end on. Uh, that it all, ultimately... it all comes together. It all comes together in this larger vision of, uh, you know, the drama of human existence, and we and we each have our own drama, and at the same time, you know, the understanding and and hope of you know why our lord and and why god the father has has allowed this to happen you know ultimately you know by his providential will that we will that we that we question at times as human beings but we'll ultimately understand beautiful and uh, as someone who speaking uh, speaking about you yourself professor Gallagher, as someone who's a man of science a psychiatrist with a very uh, a very uh, glorious sort of history and as someone who's a believer as a Catholic uh, you you're uniquely placed to speak to these issues it's a very very unique position that you have well I, I like I like a son that you emphasize I'm a man of science you know well absolutely I, I do I do not see any contradiction between my faith and science mm -hmm. people would like it that may be in a sense demonic to try to separate the two as if faith is irrational or science can't comment on some of these other issues that has never been the traditional thinking certainly of the Catholic tradition which is why Pope John Paul II you know, entitled one of his uh, encyclicals, Fides et Ratio, faith and reason joined together to illuminate our sometimes confusing human condition. And, and I think some of the greatest scientists historically were deep believers. And uh, no, no question about I, it. One of the most influential and, and let's say from a traditional question point of view maybe his his where we place him is a little controversial not so clear but one of certainly one of the most influential scientists in recent history certainly the modern age isaac newton so isaac newton he uh believed had had a theistic view of things it turns out 85 percent, if i'm not mistaken of his writings dealt with the occult deal with the occult Right. Well, he was a very thoughtful guy. He was a little heterodox, but uh, a, a, the example I often give people is to my fundamentalist friends, overly fundamentalist friends, yes. uh, who are often creationists, you know, and dispute yes. evolution. And, you know, I was talking to a fundamentalist and I said to him, uh, well, how old do you think the earth is? And he, he gave me this, you know, misinterpretation of Genesis is, you know, the earth's only been around for 5,000 years. Right, right, right. And uh, I said, first of all, that's a misunderstanding as the church has realized for, you know, millennia. Uh, it's a misunderstanding of the Bible, which is, it's, it's often a book of truths and often a book of historical truths, but it's not meant to be a scientist a, a scientific uh, description of um, creation. And I said, so you don't believe in the Big Bang? And he said, no, the Big Bang is a, uh, you know, is a diabolic trick, uh, this sort of thing. And I said, well, do you know who came up with the Big Bang theory? And he didn't know, but it was a Catholic priest. Oh, wow. Joseph, Joseph Lemestre, who was a great physicist, uh, 
Oh, wow. Actually disagreed originally because Einstein originally disagreed with him. And uh, I think Einstein eventually said, you know, that 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 priest, <laughs> that priest was right. <laughs> wow. Wow. So oh, great scientists like, you know, like Pascal, like Copernicus. Yes, yes, yes. Great, great scientists have, you're right, have often been. Yes, only... some of the greatest I and mean, some of the greatest. There's no denying it. And, and I mean, atheism in its sort of. Uh, wait a minute. No, uh, this is someone else. Sorry. That's not it. I apologize. It's, I think it's. I think L E M A I S T R E. Yeah, that's it. Joseph Lemestre. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, let's see. <laughs> We're doing this live. This is what happens when we do it live. But I'm pretty sure it's. No, it, you got it. It's L E M A. L E M A. Oh, ah, here we go. You, so you, you Google it. Here we go. Yeah? George, George, George Lemaitre. Okay, so I had it wrong. No, but yeah. no, it's, so he also has Joseph in his name. George Lemaitre. This is the guy. And you yes, see yes. the picture of him on the right. He was, yes, a, of course. he was a Catholic priest and he was a, uh, um, you know, a, a physicist. And, you know, as it says in the opening paragraph, then he said he was the first to theorize that the recession of galaxies can be explained by an expanding universe. Uh, as as um, confirmed by Hubble, and you know, as, as it says in the last sentence, there uh, he proposed a version of the Big Bang theory. Amazing, beautiful. Well, this is what we need. We need a reminder, a very serious reminder, on mass that religion is not contradictory to reason. It's not contradictory no, 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 not to, to human well-being and healing and. And people who seek to divide artificially, I think that there's something very wrong with that and potentially even demonic with that. I, I believe it's that- certainly, I believe It's certainly that. misguided because, you know, I tell people who, who have beliefs like that, I say, what happens is you, you get a, a good Christian kid who goes to college and then is confronted, say, with the, you know, the Big Bang Theory and somehow feels he has to choose Right. between the creationism and the biblical literalism that he was born with versus, you know, what do all his science professors who seem to be, you know, smart, smart people are telling him and you put him right. in a tenable conflict. Right. So somehow to be religious is to be stupid, right? And to be smart means to be enlightened and, and atheistic and what have you. But right. I mean, I, I, I believe ultimately the divine unites and the devil seeks to divide. Um, so our, our strength is in our unity, our strength is in... I, 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 could, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Gallagher. It's, it's such a pleasure and on, on a, a deeply enlightening in, in the best sense of the term and deeply spiritually enlivening. I felt this the first time I spoke with you and certainly uh, today, even more so because we've, this, is, this isn't the first time you're speaking now. So very beautiful, very, very grateful to you. God bless you and all, all that you do. Well, you're, that doing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're very welcome. It's always a pleasure to, to, to talk to you. Oh, well, the pleasure is all mine. God bless and uh, look forward to talking soon again. All right. Uh, okay. Hopefully before a year elapses the next time. <laughs> well, let, 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 let's try it or, uh, or when you get to New York. Uh, let's yes. Try it. Okay, my friend.